All right, in Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27, verse 36, is a very familiar context. And that passage there, the Lord Jesus Christ is dying on the cross, and they've just completed arraignments for his execution, and Pilate delivered him to them, and they've taken him out there on the way. He uh, falls on the load, and they take Simon the Cyrenian and have him come out there and carry the cross for him the rest of the way. And they crucified him out there between two thieves. And the Bible says in uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 36, and sitting down, they watched him. Sitting down, they watched him. Oh, we can have the lights, brother. Now I'm going to talk tonight about uh, sitting and watching. And the first thing I want to say about this subject is people like to sit and they like to watch. Uh, it's nearly always easier to get a crowd with a chalkboard than without one. People don't like to sit and listen, they like to sit and watch. You're living in a visual uh, generation. You're living in a generation when the thing has to be put where they can see it. Uh, it's been one of the great, uh, I don't know what you call a cross or a bitterness or what in my life, is that I'm the only preacher in America with a visual medium and I can't get on television. Lord put certain things on you. You take Farwell and Rex Humbart and Oral Roberts and Billy Graham, those fellows are on coast to coast on networks in prime time. They don't have a visual medium. Then the signal one of them draws a straight line. You take this thing here as a television medium. You've probably learned that for now. You can't get on. <laughs> well, tough apples. <laughs> anyway, folks like to sit and watch. And you're living in a generation when people are sitting and sitting and watching and watching and watching and watching. And men are just doing that. They're just spectators. They just sit and they just watch. We're rapidly raising a nation of people who can't do anything because they're just trained to sit and watch somebody else do it. Uh, that TV molds character. It molds character. It kills creativeness. It makes them come out all the same. A little boy was one time in the school and he was given the alphabet and he got A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, M, L, P, Q, R, S, T, and then he couldn't go any further. And finally the teacher said, what comes after T? And the boy behind him said, B. <laughs> a lot of people think that. They got so much of that stuff in their house. TV, TV. Moles character kills creativeness. I know it kills creativeness because I was raised in the Depression. And the Depression uh, kids uh, that grew up with me, you had to find something to do. I mean, the one thing to do because you didn't have any money to do it with. You had to invent all kinds of things. We get little old sticks and whittle both ends of them. They look like a zeppelin. Put them down the ground, take another stick. I mean, the stick is off a tree. Cut it off a tree. And hit one end of that thing and bounce up in there and then slap it. We call that a peewee. We hit those things. We used to take willow sticks about this long, put green apples on them and mud balls and have fights over houses with them. <laughs> we get a snowball, get a garbage can lid for a shield, you know, and fight with snowballs. We had to think of all kinds of things. We didn't have enough money to buy nothing with. Um, these kids are going to play war now. They buy them a Buck Rogers shield and a Star Wars helmet, you know, and a 20th, 1st century zap gun. Get out there. Never a zap gun. All you have with mud balls and green apples. <laughs> Back in those days, when we, had a, when we had trouble playing football, we'd get an old football and go flat. And when the old football go flat, there's nothing you could do with it. I mean, nobody had a needle and nobody had a pump. And so we take the football and stuff it full of rags. <laughs> Uh, you never played football unless you played football on stuff full of rags. <laughs> Boy, you pump that and it really goes. <laughs> I watched this bunch of kids come up in this last generation, this last bunch of kids that came up when they played baseball, they got them to have a $25 glove. They got to have them a $6 cap. They got to have them little knee breeches around here, cleats on the shoes. Man, we were lucky to have shoes. <laughs> we played in bare feet sometime, first base was a tree. You didn't dare slide into it. <laughs> And you take that bunch right there, you see, don't slide in the first base anyway. Jackie Robinson did. He did almost all the time he played. Look, look, look spectacular, you know. You take that kind of thing, it kills creativeness. Kids these days say, nothing to do, nothing to do, nothing to do. What'll I do? they nothing to do. They can't think of anything to do. They're not trained to be creative. Uh, they just sit and they watch, and they sit and they watch, and they sit and they watch. Like I said, back in those days, well, back in those days, it was a treat to go to the zoo, man. I mean, kid couldn't just wait to go down and look at a bunch of silly old animals sitting down there. Some of the little old towns out west, I mean, the biggest thing they ever had was a peacock. <laughs> they might have had a badger and a couple of rabbits and a squirrel in there. They have any elephants in them. Kid say, let me go to the zoo, you know. I want to go to the zoo to see the monkeys. You know, honey, what do you want to go to see the zoo, go to the zoo to see the monkeys for when Aunt Hilda is here? <laughs> That's funny if you think about it. <clears throat> now, you take that TV. You take that TV. That thing, uh, I don't have one in the house. I'd rent one around Super Bowl time to watch the Super Bowls and around World Series time when my boy used to live in the house. 
My boys are athletically inclined. I get there for a couple of weeks, then I get it out of the house. And even for a couple of weeks, it's bad enough. I mean, you get that thing there, watch a good ball game with. They got all kinds of half-naked women and belly dancers and beer shot in your face. The whole thing, it stinks. And you take when I go out and up and down this country meeting, sometimes I'll monitor that thing and see how the country is doing. I monitored about uh, eight shows in about eight years. And I tell you what I picked up. I picked up one show where uh, the, the little plot was this uh, lady come to this town, she's a librarian, and a little boy in the town, about 10 or 12 years old, accused her of being a communist. And then uh, he accused her of being a communist, and he's in a burning building and likes to get killed, and she rescues him in the burning building. And after she rescues him in the burning building, he goes and tries to burn the library down because he said this woman who's a librarian had some communist books in it. And the whole town meets, and the gist of that movie if then that movie, all the town fathers and all the mayor and all the people come around this woman and apologize to her for calling a communist and realize that freedom to read is part of the American heritage and every library should have some good communist books in it. That's the way, to, that's the way America was found, that way, huh? Uh, I saw another one one time where a man and his, and his uh, son are both running for political office to be candidates and some guy threatened to kill him. And his mother's a right winger, and his mother's a right winger who's pictured in the picture is about half crazy. And she instructs her son to assassinate these two fellows running for office, and both of them look like Kennedy by strict accident. And then during the play, the, during the thing, while the thing's going on, the woman is called insane, and the fellow's out to kill the communist is called an idiot. <laughs> Why you didn't call those people over there in Vietnam idiots for killing all those boat people and driving them off, did you? Our people, I haven't heard anybody call uh, Harvey Oswald an idiot yet. And he was a communist. Why is a man who's a right winger an idiot if he's trying to kill a communist, but when a communist kills somebody else, he's not an idiot? Would you tell me what that is? That's an interesting double standard you got there. Now, you know what that stuff is doing? Listen, that stuff is going out all over this country. That stuff is going out all over this country, and people are sitting in front of that one eyed monster, that baleful blue light and just sopping that stuff up like a hog licking up slop. I came across a show there one time, and it was a story about uh, Scotland. And in that picture of Scotland, it had the British troops coming in under Lord Cumberland and wiping out the, Scot the Scotchmen who were trying to put back on the throne Bonnie P Prince Charlie. And that movie was all made out, so Bonnie Prince Charlie was a fine, godly young man who loved the Lord. It was a great spiritual fellow and just the ruler the, the Scotch people needed. And that thing was all made out so that when Lord Cumberland came in with his nasty men, they killed and murdered all these poor bunch of helpless Catholics in Scotland that couldn't help themselves, these poor, ignorant, downtrodden folks with no civil rights. And the army that came in ten times, the TV show had said, Protestant, 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 Protestant. They didn't tell you Bonnie Prince Charlie came in from the country to overthrow the country and give it back to the Catholic Church. They didn't tell you rebelled against the English throne and tried to turn it back to a Catholic Church state. They didn't, when they showed that picture, when that thing took place, Lord Cumberland, in that particular engagement, there wasn't more about a thousand Catholics killed, they were killed in armed warfare. Why don't they show a picture about the St. Bartholomew Massacre in Paris, where 50,000 civilians were killed who didn't have weapons? What's the matter, you bunch of prejudiced bigots? You got two standards? You know what that is? That's NBC, CBS, the American Broadcasting System, putting that stuff out. And a bunch of dumb, stupid Christians sitting around watching that stuff. Just one. Oh, what a shame. Oh, what a shame. Oh, what a shame. That thing, that thing, that thing will get you. That thing is satanic. The God of this world runs that thing. You know why you have a whole generation of kids that believe in popping pills? Because that thing has been recommending pills for 30 years. You can't blame the kids. Folks talk about drug abuse. What are drugs for in the first place? What does this mean? You got a headache? Pill. Got an earache? Pill. You got a toothache? Pill. Fallen arches? Pill. <laughs> got a stomachache? Take a pill. Your hair falling out? Take a pill. <laughs> Why? How can you blame a bunch of kids for thinking that pills can't solve anything? The dumb grown-ups believe it. The dumb grown-ups believe it. They, they think pills can take care of everything. I grant you some people might have to be on a prescription. I grant you some people are, have certain kind of problems that have to be on pills most of their life, maybe. But I'll tell you, the average American is in good health. The average American... He's overweight, you know, but I mean, as far as pill goes, that American can get along just fine without pills. I mean, uh, I probably abuse my body as much as any man that ever lived, and Lord been good to me like he'd been good to a lot of you. You take, I, I guess I maybe had uh, four or five aspirins or four or five antibiotics in uh, eight years, something like that. 
I don't know when the last time was, maybe uh, two years ago for a week, maybe when I was in the, in the hospital. No, we tried, we tried one thing there, it didn't work, it didn't take anyone in the hospital after I got out. You take that kind of, you'd be amazed how well you can get along without pills. Yeah. Thing you do is start eating some good food, brother. And hey, listen, if you hadn't got the money, and the Lord knows you haven't got, got money for good food, and you're willing to lay off the stuff that's uh, rotten, God will take care of you. I've been where you're sitting. I've been in that trailer for $30 a week with three children. Probably had to eat rice. Rice is good for you. Rice is better for you than white bread. And they had to eat canned salmon, you know, and canned tuna, you know. Well, tuna and salmon is better for you than steak. See, I mean, there are ways to do it. You know, I had to use honey instead of sugar. Well, honey is better for you than sugar. By the time you get a, you take a jar of honey, there a half a teaspoon of that sugar is just as sweet as two tablespoons of sugar these days. The thing is, uh, be, use, use some sense about it. You take that TV, that TV is out to turn this whole nation a bunch of drug, ad, drug addicts. You get a bunch of drug ad, addicts, why then, you know what they think? They think if they get to be drug addicts, then the government will control the drugs, Food and Drug Administration, and they'll have you right where they want you. Uh, that, that TV is dangerous. That thing is volatile. I don't trust that thing. Never have trusted that thing. I don't trust the men that run it. I don't trust the men that act on it. I don't trust the men that recommend it. Somebody says, well, you know, a lot of good programs on there. Okay, throw all the rest of them all up at the good programs. They all right to have one. But they're not about to do that kind of thing. Come across there, that propaganda from morning to night. The TV M uh, MC winning award movie was a movie about uh, segregation, integration, about 10 years ago, which had nothing but just about one hour solid of white people beating black people up and sicking dogs on them and turning the water on them. And the high point of that movie was an old colored woman getting a drink of water out of a fountain where it said white. <laughs> what, a, what a dramatic scenario. <laughs> Finally got to the white fountain, did you? <laughs> well, when you got there, what do you have then? Would you tell me that? Oh, my, the thing went broke and they turned off the water. <laughs> All the white folks left town, closed the place down. <laughs> you can't win with that kind of thing. Like a fellow said, there was a time there, you know, if you want to get a colored guy to commit suicide, just put up a three-meter board over a dry pool and write down for whites only on it. They'll all be diving off it. <laughs> uh, I, don't see, I don't see any of you white folks I don't see any of you white folks trying to get into black places. Well, you must not be very good American. If you're good American, you'd be trying to get into black places, wouldn't you? I mean, black folks trying to get in here. How come you're not trying to get in there? It's a strange thing, isn't it, boy? <clears throat> you know, some of the folks in this country profess to be so level-headed, they're just as crooked as a dog's hind leg, and they profess to be so sweet and so tolerant and so broad-minded, they're so crooked man they have to screw their socks on in the morning. <laughs> That's right, brother. That's right, brother. All that stuff. Why, when you get it, what have you got then? A lady finally got to a white drinking fountain in Philadelphia. You know what happened? The day after they all got down there, some white folks came down, they got roughed up and pushed off the street. They tried to complain about it. They found out the government was on the side of the colored folks, so all the white folks moved out of downtown Philadelphia. Like they moved out of downtown Cleveland. Like they moved out of downtown Detroit. Amen. Don't kid me, man. I go there four or five times a year. Don't you kid me. I've been in Gary, Indiana. Go kid your grandmother. Let me tell you something up there, and the black folks said, go to them and the white folks leave. Don't you kid me, you Yankees. Let's see you go up there and move into downtown Gary in Indiana. I dare you to. I dare you. Any one of you, any five of you, anywhere. Go in there, first thing you know, they get shoved around, you know what a white man will do? He'll say, well, there ain't no sense in fighting City Hall, and you can't win, so I'll just move out. And it's tragic. It's tragic. Because when he moves out, the colored man's help moves out with him. Then you've got to chase and get the colored fellow to move out in the white section where the white man can help him again. The white man leaves and goes on to someplace else. Listen, Japheth in that Bible is Ham's older brother. He's supposed to take care of him. He's supposed to help him. He's supposed to help those colored folks. And listen, they put themselves in a place where you can't help them. They can't help themselves. Amen. They're up in Cleveland and Detroit and Philadelphia eating dog food. Boy, you'd better believe it. And let me tell you, when something goes wrong up there, let me tell you about those policemen up there. Those policemen up there, they don't bother to go back in there to see what's going on a lot of times. When that stuff goes down a lot of time, you know what they do? They just let them shoot each other and come by the next morning, pick up the bodies and dump them out there in the someplace. Give them an unmarked grave. It isn't right. It's tragic. But it goes to show the effect of being brainwashed by a boob tube and sitting and watching. 
You just sit and watch and sit and watch. Pretty soon you have the same morals the fellow on the TV has when, when they have any morals. <laughs> I had one of those stupid TV announcers a while back say, TV has grown to where it should now become the nation's conscience. <laughs> where would you go on TV to find a conscience? Would you tell me that? That'd be funny, wouldn't it? Would you go to soap to get one? Would you go to MASH to get one? Would you watch Morky to find out how a person ought to live? Not the stuff you'd watch, would it? A bunch of filth and garbage. Why, he doesn't have any conscience. You know what people like to do? They like to sit. They like to watch. They like to become a nation of people that just sit and sit and watch and nothing else. I was monitoring one of those programs one time, and it was a story about a fellow came into a town and set up a pornographic shop. And he set up the pornography shop and got the thing going, and pretty soon the people in the town objected, and his life was threatened. It was a small Midwestern town. And they asked him to leave out or else, get out of town or else. And he appealed to this and appealed to that. And finally the town council met, and they all had thrash it out, had a big emotional upheaval, all got the feelings out. And they all finally came to the conclusion that pornography was an excellent thing because of freedom of press. And every person in America should have an exa a chance to examine the material for himself and decide whether it was or whether it wasn't. <laughs> So that's how they got pornography in. Is that the founding fathers? If you add Adams and Jefferson and Lincoln and Washington and Franklin, those fellows sitting here, do you think that's how they look at it? I'm mean, give help the fellow out, give him a chance to kill people, give him a chance to get twisted, give him a chance to get queer. Well, listen, those fellows, even though they were deists, were Bible readers. And they read that book. I bet you Ben Franklin read more of that book than some Christians here in this town read it, and Ben Franklin wasn't even a Christian. Now you take that kind of thing, it comes from sitting and watching. People like to sit. People like to watch. That isn't all. People like to watch suffering. They like to watch people hurt. You wouldn't think people would be like that, but they're like that. They like to watch uh, buildings burning. There's something about a building on fire people can't resist. You go down the street and you hear that siren going, you know what you do? I mean, if you got time, you follow the fire truck. You say, where is it? Looks like it's over there. The smoke coming over there. Well, I saw a light back over there. But where are those cars going there? People like to watch that. Get around and watch somebody's house burn to the ground. You know, maybe something about that kind of sadistic. I don't know. But I know one thing. I know it's so. People like to watch burn. They like to watch fire. Before we went overseas back in World War II, they showed us a very interesting film taken by the Signal Corps called Baptism of Fire. And that thing with Signal Corps films taken from various combat actions in the South Pacific and in Germany where nine times out of ten the photographer was a dead man when he got through photographing the thing. It goes right in the middle of the thing. They get up the film later and develop them. Some of them got out. But you take that thing there. I remember seeing pictures there of Germans coming out of the top of tanks caught by a flamethrower and running 15 to 20 feet and rolling the ground and screaming and yelling and burning up. I remember seeing pictures of pulled japs out of holes just burned to a cinder like a roast barbecue and those kind of things. It's the kind of thing you wouldn't want to look at, but you look at it. You look at it. You watched it. Some of those guys got sick. Some of them vomited. Some of them fainted, but you watched it. I saw them one time in those films take about 100, 200 Chinese and tie them up with barbed wire so they couldn't get out and throw gasoline on them and set fire to them. And I saw it. I saw it. I was looking. I was watching. People like to watch suffering. The Bible said about Jesus Christ sitting down. They watched him there. Sat down to watch him die. Sat down to watch him suffer. That's the way people are. They like to watch fire. They like to watch wrecks. You say, I get nothing out of watching a wreck at all. Oh, listen, some of you folks, if you get a ticket to go to the Annapolis Speedway, you'd go. I don't guess anything duller than an auto race unless it's a golf game. <laughs> nothing duller than a bunch of cars taking off. You know. And then 1 o'clock. 1.30. Two o'clock, three o'clock, three thirty. What a what a drag, man! I get more excitement out of a leaky balloon, man. <laughs> Take films, those things, and show those films. Fellow said I've seen better film on teeth. <laughs> All that stuff. Some guy like Petty, one of those guys, starts off. You know, the first one of the first three going to win it every time. He gets in the lead and stays in the lead unless something goes wrong with his car. Some go wrong with this crowd, the second guy gets it. Some go wrong with this crowd, the third guy gets it. You never see anybody come up from the pack. You might as well make it mine before it starts. One of the first three cars takes off, going to win it. What a drag, man. What a drag. <laughs> you say, why do people watch that? They hope some car will go over the rail. They hope some wheel will come off and fly over the grandstand. They'll hope some motor will come out of a car like happened at LeMay's, went across the place there, 
taking off heads and arms and legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They go there and watch for that. They hope for that. Get the money's worth. You know what people like to do? They like to sit. They like to watch. While you taking this country here a couple of years back, somebody put out a movie about a giant shark, and they didn't even have a giant shark. Guy made the thing in his basement. <laughs> I made some big old uh, uh, plaster of Paris machine there, and a bunch of rubber and junk and wires in it, and operated the thing like a mechanical monster, like a robot, and put that thing on, and that movie, I, I forget what the thing was, that thing went into millions of dollars, people watching that thing. You know, they want to see a shark bite somebody. <laughs> well, it's, why don't you go down to the beach and stick your leg out a while? Maybe one will bite it. <laughs> I mean, uh, you people, they try to act so nice, you know, and so good and so sophisticated. Let me tell you something. There's many a man, there's many a woman, there's many a doctor, there's many a lawyer in this town that would turn up his nose at our kind of preaching, our kind of singing, and talk about being vulgar and unrefined and uncouth and non-Christian, they're so high and so slick and so smooth, and those jackasses pay $10 to see a shark eat somebody. Yeah, man. Amen, amen, amen. Some of you quiet folks must have bought some admission and seen that mess. <laughs> I'll tell you, no, here, you know, no use looking up at me. I ain't going to pay for it to go see it. I guarantee you. I, I, I'm one of the few people in America that didn't see Star Wars and didn't see Jaws and isn't about to see him either. I could care less, man. If I wanted to see a bunch of UFOs, you go down the beach and look for them. I wouldn't go to some cotton-picking movie and sit there and look up in the air for them. You take, out, you, you take about sharks, you want to see some sharks? <laughs> go down that beach a while, walk up down that beach, you'll see some sharks. You want to see some sharks? You get you in a little piper club and just fly that beach and go down that beach about, that one right down there, about 100 yards offshore. You see them in schools, man. You want to see Jaws? Go to Alabama Point some hot day in the summer and go over that bridge and look right off to your left on the north side there where the bay comes in and crosses there. It's that old bird line there about 10 feet long, right off that thing. That's all the closer I want to get to Jaws. <laughs> I mean, I've been out there. I've been out there in the bayou at night catching those mullet and going out there at night to catch mullet and taking that net and stood there and stood real quiet, you know, for about 15 minutes. Heard the mullet coming down the the uh, canal. You don't hear that much anymore. They've got the thing all roped in, roped off, and boxed in, boxed out, the place where they are you can't get to, you know, and all this and that. I mean, it, you know, trying to protect you, you know, protective custody, you know, environmental agency, you know, communism, all that stuff. And they get that thing going like that. You can't get where they are anymore, but listen, there you'd be some beautiful nights down there. You stand on that channel at night and stand there down there in the moonlight and stand there in the dark with your net like this and up there way up the way you'd hear. Then pretty soon, flop, right next to you. Be about here, take that net, and throw that net, pitch that net out like that. One night I pitched that net out, and boy, when I pitched that net out, that water by me lit up like you turn on a 200 watt bulb. There was some old shark lying there about six feet long, boy. And that thing scared him just as bad as it did me, man. <laughs> well, that net hit, he went, woo, like that. Well, he was waiting for him, too. You know, I might have stepped in that bird in, every, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Now, what would I be doing paying $5 to go see a movie for, man? <laughs> I was out there fishing one day off Alabama Point and got that net going. I was standing out there and I looked around and all of a sudden I saw a shark sitting off there about six to eight feet long, about far here in that wall, just lying there, pointed at me. And I got that net up between me and him, got ready to throw that thing down in case he got a little nervous. And about that time, one of those uh, blue angels came over that beach. That thing went, wow, I'm going over there and scared that shark. And I think that shark was just scared as I was anyway. He made for me like a rocket. And when he got up, right up, you know, with about five feet, then he saw an object ahead of me, he turned away. They, anything will spook him like that. But boy, just for a mad minute, I thought he was coming to eat me, you know. But he was just scared. <laughs> and boy, I dumped that net between him and me, and I went the length of that rope the other direction. <laughs> I, heard a guy, I heard a guy out there say one time, he said a 12-foot 12 12 foot shark got after him. He had a bluefish in there of that line. A 12-foot shark came along, got the bluefish, and then didn't stop with the bluefish, kept coming up the line. <laughs> and he got reeling that thing in, that shark got closer and closer. The fin came out of the water about the size of that table. And that thing out there, I don't know whether it's a white or a tiger, but it's not a sand shark. And I, that, they, they spotted it four or five times off there, and this fellow ran into it. 
and he had about a hundred dollar rod with him and a forty five dollar reel back in 1960 or 61 or two and when that thing came into him he i said what'd you do he said well i did the school solution which of course you slap the water with a rod you see he makes some noise on top he said he kept coming and he said brother pete he said you wouldn't think a fellow could walk on water but he can <laughs> <laughs> That fellow was in two feet of water, and he lifted his feet four feet at a time going out of there, brother. <laughs> now, you take that if you want to get in with Jaws. You know, interested in Jaws. Jaws out there. He's not down there at the Sanger Theater. <laughs> Folks interested in those kind of things. If there's something sadistic in human nature, there's something about human nature that wants to see people suffer, wants to see people hurt. You all have it in you. Why, one of the most popular series of, uh, of uh, daytime serials on any radio station, any TV station, is a hospital series. But it always happens. You know what people like to do? They watch people hurt, like to hear the alarm, cough, Dr. Kildare, young Dr. Kildare, Pip -pip, Dr. Gillespie, wheelchair rolling up down, you know. It's always the scene, the guy in the operating room, got his mask on, you know, you know, suture, scalpel, meat tenderizer. <laughs> <laughs> Hacksaw. <laughs> they asked they asked a little boy one time on one of those one of those talk shows. They asked him why they always had those masks on in the operating room, and he said, "Cause if that way there's a failure, nobody knows who did it." <laughs> I mean, the the hardy has ever been a movie made in the face of this earth that had to do with anybody that was civilized that didn't have that scene with the lion there in the bed. You know, and they got this rubber bag over here. You know, this rubber bag is going. <laughs> 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 Folks like to watch that. You sit around there just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't care how I don't care how refined you are, how cultured you are, you got some of that stuff in you. This is the end of side one. Please turn the cassette over. People like to watch people suffer. You needn't think that people sat down and watched Jesus Christ suffer any different than the people that are in Pentecostal today. You didn't think there was something terrible and rotten about human nature then that's no longer rotten about human nature. It isn't so. People think all oh, those folks back in biblical times, you know, or back in the Dark Ages, they were cruel times. Oh, no. In the Dark Ages, there was one church that could run things the way they wanted to. And if they got where they could run them where they wanted to them again, you'd see some cruel times again, friend. <laughs> So you've got, to, you've got to get that thing right. The trouble is a lot of dumb Christians are evolutionists. A lot of these dumb Christians, they think that things get better and better and better. And they talk about things getting better and better and better. These dumb Christians think that people get better and better. Listen, communications may get better and better, and transportation may get better, and maybe something get better. I'll tell you something, that never change. And that's that thing sitting right out there looking at me. That's human nature. You know what human nature is? Me first, you next. That's what human nature is. Don't ever change. The devil knows human nature. You know what the devil said to God one time about Job? He said, does Job fear God for naught? Next time he came up there, you know what he said to God about Job? He said, listen, he said, skin for skin, all that a man hath to give for his life. The devil knows people. You know what the devil knew? The devil knew the average man will do anything to stay alive. Now, it isn't always so. In Job's case, he'd miscalculated. In the case some Christians he miscalculated, there have been Christians who loved the Lord enough to die for him. There have been Christians who've gone to the stake and suffered horrible deaths in order to remain true to Jesus Christ. But the general rule is still the same. Skin for skin, all that a man hath to give for his life. That's the general rule. Me first, you next. That's human nature. You take people, they like to watch fights. I mean, uh, let's just face it. You like to watch fights. I do. If I had a TV, there are two things I'd watch every time they came on. I'd watch the Golden Gloves boxing, and I'd watch the hockey games. I love to watch that hockey. I watch, watch. You say you're waiting for a fight. Yeah, I like, I like, I like, I like to see those sticks go, man. <laughs> that, that's the closest thing I've ever seen to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat on a, a legitimate basis, <laughs> is that hockey. And you take a thing, what makes you like that? Well, just human nature, just like you, like to watch people fight. You say, oh, I don't like to watch that thing. Oh, yes, you do. You watch Star Wars, you know, you know, and Darth Vader, you know, the little ray guns running up and down, you know, trying to reach each other. And you folks, oh, no, I'm not like that. Oh, yes, you are. You watch those soap operas in the afternoon, and those husbands and wives fight like dogs. 
Don't, don't tell me, man, you know, and so-and-so misunderstood so-and-so and didn't go on with so-and-so anymore. You sit down there trying to keep up with ballast to see who's going to bed with who, or who used to go to bed with who that was going to bed with somebody before they went to bed with somebody else. Don't kid me. Don't kid me. Don't kid me, man. I tell you, I've been around here for 58 years. I know folks. And all that shellac and all that veneer and all that varnish, you don't kid me. Listen, human nature doesn't ever change. It doesn't ever change. Human nature is human nature. People like to watch fights. There's something about it has a it has an appeal to them. They like to watch fights. They watch Batman and the Hulk get mad, you know, and tearing down things and throwing things around. They got Superman, you know, running around and stopping stuff. I saw a good I saw a good cartoon the other day. A big old train is heading down the track, you know, and there's a car stalled in the track and a woman and a kid trapped in the car and about to burn to death, you know, the train's gonna hit him and the train coming down there at 70 miles an hour and down comes Superman and stops the train, you know, and wrecks the whole train and kills about 400 people. <laughs> you know, the guy put that thing down was realistic. <laughs> now, you take this thing right here. When Jesus Christ died in Calvary's cross, there are a bunch of people sitting around there and the Bible says sitting down. Sitting down, they watched him. They watch him. What are they doing? Watching his suffering. See how he's taking it? He's going to scream now. He's going to cry that's getting to him now. But he tried it right now, but he's not going to make it. Somebody live, somebody sitting down there watching him saying, well, he's taking pretty good. He says, how could people, people could be so cruel? How could they be so heartless? Well, they're not any different than they are today. They'll do that. People look at things, they like to watch people suffer. That isn't all. People look at things differently. Uh, you may find two that look at the thing the same way, but you very, rare, very rarely will find ten people look at the thing the same way. You take people have different ways of looking at things. Uh, one of the greatest mistakes uh, America ever made was to believe its news media and make people think that everybody thought alike. They don't think alike. Listen, when Kennedy got shot all over this country, the news media was saying, it's the worst possible thing that happened. The end of the nation has almost come. What could more terrible? He died for us that we the living might carry the banner forward. I mean, that news media put out that garbage for days and weeks and months. We all share in his death. Ah, shut up. I didn't kill him. Amen. I don't take any part in his death at all. Amen. All that kind of business. Amen. Why, they, get, they gave this whole country the idea this whole country was mourning about the death of Kennedy. I know thousands of people weren't mourning. Amen. Why, listen, boy, if you'd taken a pull downtown the day he got shot, you'd be surprised how some folks looked at things. I'll tell you something you may not have noticed, and you may not have noticed because you're never a radio announcer. But if you're a radio announcer, you noticed it if you've been around for a while, and I've been around for a while. The greatest thing that ever happened in this country to let you folks know you're living in a hell on earth is the fact that the man on the street, a regular broadcast every station America carried from 11 to 12, went off the street about 1951. Now, some of you don't know what I said. You know what the man in the street was? Amen. Every radio station had a remote broadcast between 11 and 12 and 12 at 1 in any town in America where an announcer went out there with a portable mic unit and stopped people in the street and asked them what they thought of all the current events in the newspaper. You wouldn't dare do it anymore. There isn't any station in town that would stay open for 24 hours. Because the gap between what's going on and what people know to be so is so great, there isn't any way to even get them together. Suppose you went downtown Pensacola and took your microphone and stopped the first ten people. What do you think about federal school busing to mix the races? <laughs> you wouldn't dare. You wouldn't dare put it on there. What if you got out there and said, what do you think about this uh, back in the Palestine Liberation Guerrilla Army? What do you think, sir? What do you think, madam? Would you give us a few words? You don't dare. Because the people don't think like the press thinks. They don't believe what the press believes as a whole, but they don't have a chance to say it. They're not going to get a chance either. That kind of thing is going off. People think differently. One time in a, in a restaurant, a young lady was sitting over there, attractive young woman, had a little boy about uh, two or three years old with her. Obviously, she was divorced or a widow. And she was sitting there and drinking a sort of cocktail, and the boy was crying. She was cursing him. Shut your mouth, you d little brat, you know, and blowing a cigarette smoke in his face, you know. And while she's doing that, she's flirting with a couple of young men there, you know, trying to get a prospective father. And when that kind of thing was going on, a couple of Christians there sitting at a table on down looked up there, one Christian turned the other one, uh, and said, wouldn't it be wonderful if uh, that mother just die? 
Wouldn't that be one of them said, yeah, it'd be better if the baby died. The other one said, that's right, it'd be wonderful if God just took a little baby, wouldn't it? If you're unsaved, you don't understand anything I just said. And if you're saved, you understand every bit of it. If God took out that little old baby, that little old baby go home to glory and wouldn't have to learn how to drink and smoke and cuss and grow up and be like his mother. Folks look at it different, see? Boy, any time they try to convince you that Christians think like the world thinks, they're selling you down short. If you're a child of God, you don't think like the world thinks about those kind of things. One time an old godless reprobate in a southern town came in drunk at night, raving and ranting and roaring around. Wife had to fourth the sheriff for the fourth or fifth time, get him down there and give him the tomato juice and the black coffee and the treatment. And that, by the time that thing happened, somebody said, oh, so-and-so sure was drunk tonight. Yeah, that old boy is around her. Yeah, he's a cutter. Yeah, he sure is. Well, you know, he's all right. You know, he means well. Yeah, boy, you hear him other night. Yeah, he's sure fun the night I heard him. Yeah, that fella, I'm telling you, he's a character. <laughs> and some Christian says, you know, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if he had a heart attack and died and went on home the judgment? I mean, he owns all this land out here, and his kid could finish getting to school, and his wife could pay off the bills. Folks don't look at things the same way. Now listen, when Jesus Christ died in Calvary's cross, I want to say about, I want to talk about how they looked at it. First of all, I want to say this. When the devil looked at him, you know what the devil saw? The devil saw a powerless adversary. When the devil looked at Jesus Christ, they saw somebody who was going down and taking a beating and taking a whipping. As far as the devils were concerned, it was a victory for Satan. As far as the devil and unclean spirits were, when they saw this thing, they saw a powerless opponent. If you be the Son of God, save yourself. If you be the Son of God, you save yourself. Others he cannot save. If you be the Christ of Israel, let him come down the cross, and we will believe. And the two thieves crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. As far as his adversary is concerned, were concerned, Jesus Christ was helpless in the hand of the devil. The devil had him, and the devil had him whipped, and he was about through with him. He was down and just about out. It reminds us one time one of those uh, Caesars back there years ago was about to have a Christian thrown to the lions, and he said to him, he said, where is your carpenter now? And the Christian said, making a coffin for you. <laughs> what he's doing, what he's doing, making a coffin for you. And listen, when Jesus Christ died in Calvary's cross, he sealed the devil's fate and fixed the devil's fate. And the devil hasn't experienced that fate yet, and he won't experience that fate until the second advent. But the coffin's ready. The coffin's ready and the chain's ready. General Hooker, before the Battle of Mary's Heights by Fredericksburg, General Hooker was up against the southern armies, and somebody asked him, they said, do you think we have a chance of winning? And General Hooker said, Lee is in my hand now. And he said, not even God could deliver him out of my hand. <laughs> Don't talk that way. Those Yankees went up that hill four times, never got to the top of it. Finally had to go back across the river and leave the dead behind them. You don't talk that way. What looked like a powerless opponent was a victor. The Bible says he openly triumphed over principalities and powers and put them, made a shame of them in the open, put them to shame, a public display. Jesus Christ and Calvary's cross a conquer. A Christian of cross is more than conquer through him that loved us. Thanks be unto God which always called us to triumph through Jesus Christ. So the devil saw him that way. How the soldier see him? The soldier saw him as an unfortunate uh, martyr, an unfortunate criminal. I'm afraid of the soldier's concern, routine business. I mean, after all, uh, you know, it's all in the day's work. They probably crucified several that week or several that month. And the father of the soldier's go, go was routine business. Time came to divide up the victim's garment. Somebody said, don't split it, tear it up, let's, uh, divide, let's take it and let's cast lots for it. Then one fellow get the whole thing. That's a crude, brutal way to look at things. Soldiers have always been that way. Soldiers have been practical. You've got to be practical to be a soldier. As far as they're concerned, what difference does it make in one more death? I mean, they not, don't realize they're killing God's son. I mean, uh, so he took a chance and lost. Those GIs, I know GIs, down there talking. What's, what do you, you reckon matter that character? I'll beat the, you know, out of me. Crazy fool go around shooting his mouth off. Think he had better sense. You had a bunch of Jews, you a bunch of dumb Jews, like a stupid fellow like that. Remember that guy who crucified last week? Yeah, that nut out there, we're just getting those people. What's my those folks anyway? I don't know, just running the blood. He looks like a pretty nice fellow, pretty clean-cut kind of character. Yeah, you know, just stupid. You know, it's a shame, you know. Probably never been around, don't know nothing. Probably ought to have gone out there, you know, and found what the world's all about before he tried to pull off that mess. Yeah, well, that's one of them things. I wish the blanket bank hurry up and die after 3 o'clock and I got a date down. That's how they are. Don't kid me, boy. Listen, they never wrote a Bible in up-to-date language yet. 
And if they wrote one, it'd be like that. That's how they are. They get down there, and as far as they're concerned, it's just one more death. Back there and all quiet in the Western Front, uh, Paul Bomber has to go back home and tell a, a woman about the death of her son. Her son's name is uh, Franz Kemmerich. And Franz Kemmerich died in the hospital. His amputee loses his leg. He's cut off with the knee, lying there with a basket over his knee. First time I tried to kid him about him, he's so sick he can't get up and look at his knee. He doesn't know it's been amputated. And he says, do you think I'll be all right? And Paul, his friend, says, Paul Bomber says, yes, I think you'll be all right. And Han says, uh, do you really think so? And he says, yes, I think so. He's stinky, you uh, And he bows over there, and Franz pulls him up and says, I don't think so. And Paul says, why not? And Franz says, look, shows him his fingernails. They're growing like the skin shrinking back from them, turning kind of green. They've seen them die. The guy's dying. He knows he's dying. He says, but look. And then Paul says, you must eat. Don't worry about it. You must eat. That food looks good. Tries to get his mind off it. After a while, Franz lies there and he dies. And he dies and lies there and cries. And Paul puts his arm around him and tries to help him out. Tears running down his face. And Paul says to himself, my, what a mess I've made of things with my stupid talk. Trying to tell him he'll get out, get wooden legs and be a forest ranger someday. And they make some good artificial legs, uh, Franz. And, and it isn't hopeless. I mean, uh, Bauer says they made a good set for him. And they're almost like regular legs. And the kid lie there, tears running down his face, and Paul says, here I am trying to comfort him, and I need comfort myself. And here's old Franz Kemmerich, he's 18 years old, and dying all by himself and crying for the little life is running out of him. And after what, he runs out of that place and leaves it and gets out and gets a breath of fresh air and then feels better and forgets it in two or three minutes. He's seen hundreds of men die. Then he has to tell his mother about it. And he goes home to tell his mother about it when he gets back and leave. He says, I cannot report this scene. I cannot describe this bawling woman, this pound of flesh, that, uh, this lump of flesh that weeps and cries before me and wails and screams and says, how did he die? Tell me, how did he die? Did he suffer much? She seems rather stupid to me. After all, he's dead. And she said, how did he die? Oh, tell me how he died. He said, I make up a story. And she said, oh, no, you're lying. He suffered. I heard him scream at night. And he says, I thought myself the woman must be pretty stupid anyway, but I'll, she could make mince meat out of me, but I'll not tell her. And I said, no, no, he just died real quick. He got shot. He had a good clean shot. He died instantly. And she said, do you swear it? Do you swear it? And he said, I'll swear it. He thought to himself, my God, what will I swear by? Nothing sacred with me. And this, this, the lady's, the fellow's mother, Franz's mother said, by all that's holy to you? And he said, I don't know of anything. And she says, will you swear by God that if he didn't die that way, you won't get back from the front yourself? And he just swear, he swear. Then he said, I made up a story and got to half believe it myself. <laughs> That's how soldiers are. I mean, one more death, one more death. Christ died on the cross. Too bad. Tough luck. Behaved himself. He wouldn't have got it. That's how men are. They're like that. Listen, people of Pensacola, if you think human nature has changed one word since that day, you need to check up in human nature. Human nature isn't any different than it was right then. All right, people look at things differently. You take the priest. You know what they saw? The priest saw a guilty blasphemer. They looked up there and said, serves him right. Taking the name of God in vain. Said he was the son of God. Let him come down the cross and we'll believe. And the two thieves crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. The priest saw a guilty blasphemer there. You know what the world saw? The world saw a martyr, a fellow dying for what he believed. I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ was not a martyr. Amen. He didn't die like a martyr. You know how martyrs die? They die victoriously. You can read Fox's Book of Martyrs and you'll never find one martyr saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Amen. When martyrs die, God doesn't forsake them, but God forsook him. You take old Cranmer and Latimer and Ridley when those fellows burned at the stake, Archbishop Cranmer got out there, and before he went to the stake, they tortured him and made him recant on his position, and he signed a recantation with his hand, saying he was uh, going to be a good Catholic after all. And then the next day, when they tried to let him out and give him a chance to speak, he got up publicly and recanted his recantation <laughs> and said, I lied when I signed that, and they burned him at the stake. When they burned that old boy at the stake, he held his right hand out in the fire like that and kept saying, this unworthy right hand, this unworthy right hand, let it burn off before it got to him. That's the hand that committed the sin. Burn it. You say, what a terrible thing. Oh, I don't know. That hand might have kidnapped a baby. That hand might have strangled somebody. That hand might have forged a check for $50,000. There are a lot worse things you can do with your hand than burning them for the glory of God. 
Amen, amen, amen. They saw it differently. They saw a martyr, but he wasn't a martyr. How did God look at it? God saw that thing differently than anybody saw it. When God looked down at that scene, you know what he saw? He saw a perfect sacrifice. He says, Burnt offering and sacrifice, thou wouldst not have, a body thou hast prepared me. In the volume of the book it is written, I come to do thy will, O God. And when Jesus Christ came, the Lord looked down that thing and said, Now I'll take that. I won't take anything else, but I'll take that. Bless my soul, if you ever see God's face with favor and see the pearly gates, the cherub and the seraphim and the glory of New Jerusalem, you'll see it because of that. You ain't going to see it. You're going to see it. I preached this uh, sermon the first time it went back in 19, 19, um, 1962. And I was trying to find some kind of illustration for it. And I went through an old hymn book and picked out a song and read it at the end of the sermon and put it on the tape. They didn't have it in the regular hymn book there at Brent. And the song began, Arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice on thy behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands. My name is written in his hands. When God looked at that, you know what he saw? God saw the perfect sacrifice for sin. And the Lord said, I'll take that. And it's not by the blood of bulls and goats, but by his own blood he entered the holy place, having obtained redemption for us. How much more shall the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanse us from all sin? That brings me to the end of my message, and I want to say this. I want to say that someday God's going to sit and look at you. They sat and watched him. Those cruel men, those murderers, and those torturers, and those religious scribes and Pharisees, and that bunch sat down there, and they watched God's Son writhe and suffer and agonize and pray and beg for water, and they just sat and looked. And I'm here to tell you one day that Bible says, we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Lord says, I'll sit like a refiner refining the sons of Jacob. And someday he'll be set up like that and his throne like that, and you'll be down in front, and he'll look. And he'll watch you. That Bible says every one of us should give account of himself to God. Won't that be a day? And you think about a time there, if you're unsaved, you come up before that thing, what a kind of condition you're going to be in. You say people have all kinds of troubles, and God knows you have troubles. I know you have troubles, and I try to minister to you. And Brother McGee tries to minister to you, and the trustees and teachers here try to minister to you. We try. We don't always make it, but we try. God knows you've got a lot of problems, but you don't have a problem of facing God naked in your own righteousness. Amen. You ought to be trying to get folks saved, no matter how many problems you've got. You ought to be trying to get some people saved. You're not in the mess they're in. Billy Sunday said one day he read the newspaper and read something made him sick at his stomach. He read about a case down here in Florida, along around the Everglades, where there was a little boy out with his daddy in the woods and cutting down limbs and trees and stuff. And they were out there, and the boy wandered off and got up there in one of the bayous someplace. And the old man was cutting down trees, and suddenly he heard a scream. And he heard the boy screaming and saying, Daddy, the alligator's got me. The alligator's got me. And that daddy ran through that swamp, through those cypress roots and gum stumps there, like a man possessed. And when he got there, all he saw was just the swirl in the water and the blood coming up. And Billy said, when I read that thing, he said, I worried about that thing for days. And he said, I thought to myself, isn't that a picture of it? Isn't that a picture of it? Here's the world dying, they're going to hell, and the devil swallowing them up, and they're dying their bloods and dying their sins and facing judgment, and got people sitting around the bank just watching them and playing cards and going to the movies, and they don't care one way or another. Yeah. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. I'm here to say someday that God will take a look at you. And as if you're unsaved in that day, the Bible says, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And when that day comes, you won't appear like the nice cats you are sitting here tonight. You look real great tonight, some of you. Got nice clothes on, you're all spruced up, got your fingernails clean, your hair combed, got your tie, your suit on, and got your dress on, and got the dress just right, and your hair fixed, and rolled it last night, and all that stuff. Let me tell you something, sister, brother. One of these days, one of these nights, you die without Christ, you're going to stand up there coming out of hell for a thousand years. You're going to spend a thousand years of hell before you come out anyway. You're there during the millennium. 
And when you come out with that sulfur and bring the stone coming off you and those filthy rags dripping that sediment off you and stand there in your charcoal with that stink coming off your body and that depravity in full bloom after a thousand years, it won't be the person that's sitting here looking at me tonight. It'll be the face of a living demon. A living demon. Years ago, 1854 to be exact, 4th of July, John Bannum started taking another ship around the Horn. John Bannum was a sea captain that was up there in the New England States, and he had the record time for getting around the Horn 80 days. As he gets you around the, he gets you from Boston to Frisco in 80 days. And John Bannum would walk up and down the wharf there with his gold cane and his bowler on, his top hat, the perfect gentleman, and pick him out a crew to go on the next ship with. Nobody usually say with it more than once. He reported he'd killed eight men, driven 21 crazy. And he walked up and down there with his high hat and his best Sunday manners and picked out a crew. And as he walked by there, some young fellow wanted to volunteer. And some old wharf rat there said, you better hadn't say it with John Bannerman. He said, that fellow wash off his Sunday face when he gets five miles out. When he gets five miles out, he'll wash off his Sunday face. And then you'll see the devil pop up. Well, he got him a crew. And they got in that ship and took off. They got about five miles outside of the port. And then John Bannerman went through his usual routine. And he called all the crew up there, got him up there in the foredeck, and got his Negro boy to bring him a bucket of salt water, a boy named Robinson, who was half crazy, did on about five trips, giggling, you know, half out of his mind. And he got his boy Robinson to bring him a bucket of salt water up there, and he called all the crew up there in the pastures, and he said, all right now, you swabbies, you scum. He said, come around, I'm going to preach you a sermon now. I'm going to preach you a sermon now I'm going to dip my face in this bucket of water, and when I finish washing off my Sunday face, up pops the devil, laughing like a maniac, and stuck his head down that bucket. And he stuck his head down that bucket, and when he brought his head up out of that bucket, he was just screaming like a demented man. And that crazy cabin boy, that Robinson, had filled that thing full of red devil eye. That thing was just all over his face and just eating his face out. He was dead in about two days. Now listen, that fella pulled that hip out of that bucket there, and they saw that stuff. You know what they saw? They saw the real man. And the real man is not a fella with his shoe shine and his tie in place and his sleeve a quarter of an inch out with his gold cane strolling down the boulevard, tipping his bow to the ladies. The true man is a worm-eaten, bloody, pockmarked face with staring eyeballs, rabid look, screaming mouth, and great that's the man and someday that thing will come up there and the Lord will sit there like this and he'll he'll watch he'll watch let's go to the Lord in prayer now Father I pray the Holy Spirit of God will take these weighty matters and lay in the hearts of every man woman and child in this building God forbid anybody should go out of here unprepared God forbid anybody should go out here trusting their goodness and their righteousness and their cleanness to get them to heaven. And I pray for any unsafe person that's building there, trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember that once he was delivered to their hand, but someday they're going to be delivered to his. Lord, help them to think about these things soberly and seriously in this hour, I pray. Now listen, may they head bowed and eyes closed here a few minutes in prayer. Head bowed and eyes closed. In a moment we're going to stand and sing an invitation to him. If there's the slightest doubt in your heart here tonight about your condition of salvation, the thing for you to do is get to Jesus Christ just as quick as you can get. Just as quick as you can get. The hidden man of the heart that nobody's ever seen, someday it's going to appear in all its horror. And maybe your wife, and maybe your husband, never seen it. Maybe none of your family doesn't know it's there. But God knows. Before you have to stand in front of him, let him do the watching. You... Turn your eyes on Jesus tonight. Look full in his wonderful face, and the thing in this world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The Bible says, Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved, for I am God, there's none else. Friend, look and live. Bless the invitation, Lord. Help these people are saved to sing this song from the heart.